Hey everyone, back again. Now we've arrived. We are at the last part of this monster after covering, insert F word, Adam Smith, David Ricardo, Capital Volume 1, 2, and now right at the end of Capital Volume 3, uh, I want to never read Political Economy ever again in my life, even though I'll probably do the Gundrissa at some point, but I'll do more marks. But I'm just happy to have read all of these texts and to have had you listen to them. I hope I've been insightful, and I hope I've given people the opportunity to know what goes on in these texts without having to read it themselves, because uh, the key is to make these things accessible, and I do my best to present them in th what I believe to be as close as the way they were meant to be interpreted. Now, that's impossible, of course, but I just try to present it as neutrally as possible. So I hope that I've been helpful, and if I have, you can consider helping me out just by liking, sharing, subscribing, sharing with your friends, or helping me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal, but obviously no pressure. Um, take care of yourselves first is really what's important. But this episode is going to cover from chapter 49 of part 7, which is in within part 7, titled On the Analysis of the Production Process, all the way to the end, including Frederick Engels's supplementary remarks. So let's just jump right into it here with chapter 49 on the analysis of the production process. So here he's focusing on the ways that political economists like Adam Smith, Ricardo, even Proudhon, um, originate or locate the origin of value in the cost of wages, rent, and profit. They do not then understand how constant capital fits in the equation. They just forget that this thing called constant capital exists there. Well, and, you know, this is really some political economists, you know, some, like we mentioned in the last episode and earlier on, you had the head of the Bank of England or other people like that saying that value is determined by the amount of capital in circulation, referring, of course, to the amount of machinery and constant capital in circulation. But anyways, that's just to kind of orient you in to what this chapter is going to do. So profit plus rent is the totality of surplus value. But it's important to also add that we understand profit here as profit plus interest as well. Because part of the money is likely going to be going to a landlord. And some of it is likely going to be going to uh, uh, somebody who lent money for, for that capitalist to start that business. Now, these three things, profit plus interest plus rent, are the totality of what labor has created. And this is both the labor that is alive, working people in those industries, plus the labor that is done uh, previously to create machines and to create raw materials. It's just that raw materials and machines trans just transfer their value into the objects. They don't create new value, whereas real living labor transfers their value plus extra into the objects being made. So the value of real labor, because that is what is lending, creating the value at the end of the day, is what is, it's just what is creating value at the end of the day. So Marx asks, how do we account for the costs of constant capital? How do we actually figure into the equation some portion of the profit to go back to constant capital? Because the capitalist has to pay the worker. Ostensibly, they have to pay the workers. They have to pay the person they borrowed money from, if they borrowed money. They have to pay rent, and they have to pay themselves. So to understand this, he brings us back to Capital Volume 2. Now, if you remember from Capital Volume 2, he talks about exchange on kind of a broad scale, breaking up the entire capitalist market into two industries. There are those industries that produce the means of production, and there are industries that produce the means of consumption. So the industries that produce the means of production are the people who are making things like the raw materials for other industries or making the machines for other industries or equi other equipment for other industries. Whereas the industries that produce the means of consumption 
are what is bought by everybody, not just other capitalists for their own industries, bought by everybody in order to live. So these are the industries that are making food or building shelter or clothing, whatever, that everybody is going to need. And these are kind of the, these make up the totality of uh, the capitalist system. And then there are other, you know, there the industries that produce luxury goods that would fall under the branch of consumption, but they aren't open to everybody. So the industry that produces the means of production only sells to capitalists, so only sells to the producers of the means of um, both consumption and production but the owners there, the people who are going to buy things. And then the people who produce the means of consumption are going to be, are going to have set of buyers among all the industries, among all the people, even the owners. Okay, and so there is a relationship between the two industries. Because industry one produces the means of consum uh, production, of production, that means that their products end up as constant capital in industry two, in the means of, of consumption, or other industries in the means of production. So their product, their end product that they've made, is going to become part of the constant capital of all of these other industries that buy those products. So if we took all of that industry, all of the industry of the means of production, producing the means of production, if we add it up, the entirety of their profit, and here we're understanding profit, or better to use the term value, we're understanding their value as just the end product after you've factored in wages plus the surplus value. So this is really how much is being the objects are being sold for. That same amount should be the exact same as what is costing the constant capital the capitalist constant capital or the entirety of all the constant capital in the second industry, in the industry of the means of consumption, because they buy those items, they buy the raw materials and equipment from the means of production at their prices. And so that total value becomes part of the constant capital in the mean, the industry of the means of consumption, which is just objectified it's just dead labor. So really, to put it, I really want to make this clear because uh, I'm fumbling through it a little bit because it's tricky to explain. So these values within the means of production of industry one who produce the means of production, that is surplus value of their end product, come out to cost of objects sold that serve as the means of production for industry two that make the means of consumption. So because the means of production in terms of constant capital do not create value, that means that within the production process in either industry, that which is paid out in wages, profit, and rent is going to represent revenue. Whereas that which is paid out in constant capital is not gonna be transformed into any kind of revenue because you don't pay a machine that's going to earn you more. What you are doing is you've bought a machine and that machine is just going to slowly distribute its value as it depletes into the objects that it helps to make. So gross income is going to be wages plus profit plus rent because machines don't earn income. Only Income can only come out in the form of wages plus profit or rent, where workers are earning money, capitalists is earning money as profit, and then landlords are earning money as rent. And profit here is also understanding interest in case there's somebody borrowing. Whereas net income is profit plus rent minus wages, because wages are, they come out of profit. Now this same formula applies to all of society. How though is the whole society supposed to pay for things that aren't just comprised of values of wages, rent, and profit, but also constant value of constant capital. Because if all revenue comes out in the form of profit, rent, and wages, then there should be no amount left to actually cover the cost of constant capital. 
Now, the simple answer to this, and to be quite frank, I'm not, I, I think that this is an undeveloped thought, an undeveloped idea that Marx gives us here. The simple answer, and I think he gets into it, is that it just comes out of profit. So the capitalist doesn't take all of the profit for themselves. They put some of it back to cover cost of constant capital. But Adam Smith thought that the value of constant capital is covered by its continual transformations, where one capitalist buys it from industry one uh, to use it in industry two. And this is also him just submitting to the idea that value is created within the circulation sphere, within exchange. However, this doesn't explain how the forwarded cost is covered by consumers. That is, if we submit to the idea that uh, the cost of um, constant capital or its value was covered by its continual transformations. That wouldn't explain how there would be any amount of money actually earned at the end of the day that would be paid or that could be paid to actually cover it. So if we say instead that a portion of the surplus value coming out of profit is to actually be dedicated to the maintenance of constant capital, Marx says that this is perhaps the only kind of surplus value that would remain in a post-capitalist world. Because even in a world in which labor has been reduced drastically, we rely more on automation, we're still going to need to take some portion of what is made, because there's always going to be some labor required. So some portion of what would go to wages has to actually go back to machines. And this is what he suggests right now, and he's going to elaborate, is what is necessary to come out of surplus value that doesn't go right back to workers. But he qualifies that there would be some fund as well to cover those who can't work, like people who might be ill or children or elderly people who can't do work that creates value, that creates products, or at least helps in the distribution of those products. Uh, so this encourages me to ask, if it is used in such a way, does it cease to be surplus value? Because if it is used instead of going to a capitalist or, so they can buy more yachts or earn more money, does it cease to be surplus value? Or does it cease to be alienated labor? So if part of the product of workers is not going back to them, if some of it is actually going to somebody else, but in this case, it's going to heal the sick or to educate the population or to um, cover the costs of, of basic infrastructure, whatever. Does it cease to be alienated labor? Because for all intents and purposes, it still is. The people aren't earning 100% of what they're producing. But there's something about the change in the way that it is being deployed or that money is being employed that changes it, that qualitatively changes the nature of work itself so that it is not alienated labor. Now, he ends the chapter by saying that even, uh, af even after capitalism, the determination of value will remain in order to regulate, in his words, labor time and the distribution of social labor among various production groups. And it would just be, it's just, easier if there is some way to measure value uh, in order to understand and to make sure that no one is earning above what they should be. Uh, nobody is just sitting idly by and just earning money to do nothing and so-called passive income, very popular term today, while other people are out there working to actually make money in order to live. And yeah, that puts us here into chapter 50 titled The Illusion Created by Competition. So as a recap, the price of commodities is reducible to the amount to cover the constant capital, the amount spent on wages, and the extra that is supposed to cover profit, interest, plus interest, plus rent. Now there can be so many variations in these, these the dynamic between these three things. So for instance, wages can go up uh, while the rate of surplus value stays the same. We've already talked about all this. Uh, or the rate of surplus value can go down or it could go up. So if, if, if the cost of wages has gone up and surplus value has uh, 
maybe stayed the same, this could be a situation or it has gone down. There could be a situation where what has happened is that the productivity of labor has grown less, has been reduced. And to compensate the capitalists just takes a smaller amount of surplus value to keep their prices competitive. So the surplus value has come down while wages perhaps have even gone up. By contrast, if there is a sudden increase in the price of constant capital, as another possible scenario, it can be very difficult to compensate without raising prices to make up for it. So if wages go up, the capitalist can just say, oh, I guess I'm not going to make $10 million this year. I might make $6 million. And that will mean that I can still remain competitive. I can keep my prices the same. That is, you don't need to raise them in order to actually be competitive in the market. Now, if there's a rise in the price of constant capital, like machines and raw materials, it can be very difficult to compensate without raising prices to make up for it. So you can't, like you can with labor, make it work harder or longer. You can't make people, uh, you can't whip them, you can't whip a machine to make it work harder. It's just going to do what it was what it's designed to do. It's just going to transfer its value to the object. And so these, these things are all intertwined. Wages, profit, rent, what is spent on constant capital, they're all intertwined. They might have effects on one another. They might not. Uh, one thing might affect the other things more. It might not. Uh, it's, but it's important to recognize that they exist as a whole in this kind of trinity, trinity type way. Vulgar economists, out, though, though, like to think of wages, profit, and rent as three separate entities, when obviously, for Marx, they are intertwined as the trinity of capital. And this encourages me to ask, how is the value of wages, profit, and rent determined? How do we actually figure out what they're worth? Surely not by their value in gold or silver, because the value of gold and silver is determined by wages, profit, and rent that go into extracting them. So for David Ricardo, he entertains this idea that the value of labor is determined by how much gold uh, an hour of labor will get you. And of course, the issue there is that the value of gold is going to be determined by the difficulty of labor that goes into actually extracting the gold, where the worst mine, the hardest to work on mine, like in the case of farming, is going to set the prices of the gold which means that labor had to work harder, which means that the value of gold is determined by the difficulty of labor, the value of labor. So what we have here under this system, which is just an entirely absurd thing, is that the value of labor, which kind of serves as the bedrock of the law of value, is in itself not clearly defined. It is, you can't just say, the value of labor equals anything because anything that you equal it to is itself going to be contingent upon the value of labor. So other economists might say that the value of labor is determined by the supply and demand of labor, but where if there's a, a high demand for labor, then it's going to be worth more. But of course, that doesn't tell us actually anything about the value of labor. It just tells us about variations in the labor's relationship to other commodities. If there's a high demand for labor, that probably means there's a shortage of commodities. Or if there's a low demand for labor, there might be an abundance of commodities and, and so on. And then instead of gold or supply and demand, some economists might say, oh, the value of labor is determined, determined by the amount, um, the means of subsistence. So what the cost is, to keep that labor going. And this is something we get in Adam Smith. But of course, the problem with that is that the means of subsistence, like corn or shelter, is determined by labor, where if it is difficult to build a house, it'll be worth more. If it is difficult to grow crops in a certain area, those crops will be worth more. And so labor just is always going to be, uh, is not a very good indicator here. And he, he, of course, he acknowledges that labor is the root of this. Labor is the root of value. It is consistent across all of these various systems. But at the same time, we can't say for sure what value really is because we can't say for sure what the value of labor is. Now, another person might say that competition might determine the value of labor 
or value generally? If so, then there is no natural value because that would only be observable at a point of equilibrium where, when competition doesn't exist, which again, totally hocus pocus. Now, what about profit? The value of profit. Does competition set a natural rate of profit? Obviously not, because competition only contributes to the equalization of a rate that must have been conditioned outside of competition. So if the average rate of profit is 10%, and in order to remain competitive, all industries need to somewhat gravitate to that, and competition kind of tempers anybody going far beyond that. At least this is the political economist's dream, that competition will reel people back in. How did this 10% profit rate actually get established? Because when we say 10% profit rate, we're saying a point of equilibrium across all industries. But that doesn't tell us anything about why it's 10% and why not 8%, 4%, or 100%. And the same issues emerge when we think about rent. How is the value of rent determined? And competition might step in here as well to provide an answer, where it's, oh, competition is going to determine the rate of rent. And it's going to temper anybody charging too much rent. And the same, you know, same for back to labor or competition. And anyways, I think you get it. The point here that Marx is making is that competition within the capitalist economy is setting the condition for the naturalization of a kind of nat so-called natural market price that comes to stand in for what value is. But this is totally illusory. Now that puts us here into chapter 51, titled Relations of Distribution and Relations of Production. So by, distri by distribution here, he refers to the ways the total earned money is distributed as wages, profit, and rent. So all the money earned out of industry has to be spread out in those ways. Capitalism naturalizes this form of distribution, where all money earned just naturally has to be paid in these ways. Of course, other economic systems have their own forms of distribution that they naturalize. So it's not just capitalism that's doing this thing called naturalization. Engels and, and Marx are very clear that naturalization occurs at every level uh, under each economic system because it is within that economic system's interest to naturalize itself so that it won't change. So there are established codes for relations between capitalists workers, and landlords. And these codes are going to be social, they're going to be cultural, the kinds of relationships that people can have with one another, where people are going to live, how they are to address one another, uh, who is going to be destined to actually earn money, who is going to be destined to just be working. And it's these cycles just reproduce themselves time and time again. So many rich people today are not rich because they worked hard. I, I would hazard that above 90% of all of the world's richest people got rich likely because they already had a ton of money waiting for them like in uh, as an, an inheritance or they happen to get a big loan from their parents that 99% of the world's population has absolutely no access to. But because this world it works in such a way as to celebrate wealth, no matter how it is acquired, suddenly those people are associated with having had earned that money or they are believed to have earned it as though other people who do not have that money simply did not work as hard. And once we begin to recognize that these relations are historically contingent, they aren't universal, they aren't natural, the very existence of capitalists, wage earners, landlords, lenders, they aren't natural type of relations that anyone can have with one another. They are historically determined. And once we acknowledge that, we can acknowledge the propensity for them to change and the possibility for these relations to change to try to create a more equitable world. And that puts us here into the final chapter that is uh, it's unfinished. And it's, it's kind of sad, actually, because it just clearly this was put together as a labor of love by Engels. And to have it just end, it ends so abruptly, almost like mid-sentence, um, it's just kind of sad. And I kind of want to read the last sentence here where he's talking about um, different classes of society. And I'm going to actually elaborate on the chapter. I just want to read the last bit. 
He's saying that the same would hold true for the infinite fragmentation of interests and positions into which the division of social labor splits not only workers, but also capitalists and landowners. The latter, for instance, into vineyard owners, field owners, forest owners, mine owners, fishery owners, etc. And then we get a note from Engels saying that at this point the manuscript breaks off. Which is it's, it's sad, because that's as far as he could get uh, before he died. But also sad for Engels, like who, like, I can't even fathom the amount of work that Engels put into putting this together, making sense of what Marx wrote down in his manuscripts and his notes, and creating this cohesive whole here. It's just, I don't know, I, I will never amount to doing anything of that, that caliber, and it's just, it's awe-inspiring. And it's also sad, because here, Marx is, is getting to a degree of a level of nuance that the entirety of the other texts were leading up to. And that is to look at the differing ways that classes are divided. So how do we actually, under, and that's the title of the chapter, chapter 52, classes. How are cha classes different within themselves? How are different workers different from one another? And what binds them? Likewise with capitalists. Now, I don't know how close Marx was to actually completing this project. Uh, I think there was a, there, there is a fourth volume that's called Theories of Surplus Value that I don't think I'm going to do. Um, I don't think Engels was totally satisfied with it, but it was, it's kind of a collection of different theories about surplus value and Marx just goes through and debunks them. So I don't really think it gives us much more here. It's more saying that this is not, like, look at all these things that surplus value is not, according to Adam Smith, Ricardo, Proudhon, so on. But anyway, so in this chapter, he says that classes are muddy. It's too simple to just say that there are workers, there are capitalists, and there are landowners. So you might see what I mean, where this is like a, an important degree of nuance, especially, I think, to understand capital today, where Marx says that there are the three main ones. Like, we can't lose sight of this. There are workers, capitalists, and landowners. However, we have to look at other things, like where do we put doctors? Where do we put government workers, government officials? Where do we put teachers? And so on. Or moreover, how do we engage with differences between different people? And as I mentioned, as I read from that last bit, considering the differences between field owners and vineyard owners and people who own fisheries, now, I don't think it changes the central thesis that there are classes of people that are exploiting another class of people. I, th that doesn't get changed here. But I think that having a more nuanced perspective would allow for a broader understanding of the various ways that this exploitation might occur. And then that puts us here, that's the end, that puts us here into uh, Engels' supplementary remarks. So here he says that he wanted to keep the text as close to the original as possible. And like I've mentioned all throughout these episodes, I, there are just a few points, really, where Engels steps in and says, this is me talking now. I just need to elaborate this point or clarify something Marx said. So this supplement, he treats this supplement as an opportunity to comment on two big points. That is the law of value and the profit rate and, and, profit rate and the stock exchange. Now, about the law of value, he's going to comment on the mystery of it, really, but he's also going to talk about the stock exchange and how it, it was different, very much different than the way Marx was writing about it, where at the time uh, Engels thought it was important to add how it had changed. So Engels begins by looking at this issue of the law of value and the profit rate. And first he addresses the work of some, someone named Loria, who criticizes Marx uh, for downplaying the role of exchange in, in determining value. And of course, we know that Marx didn't downplay that. Exchange doesn't create value. Loria says that it is exchange that determines value, and therefore it is impossible to come up with a total value, as Marx does, by, and Marx does this by quantifying actual labor uh, in commodities. So Engels just puts Loria in his place by showing that it is possible to find total value. Assume supply and demand were equal, as the political economists like to do. 
and there was $100 of supply and $100 of demand. Loria's formula would say that there's there, therefore zero value because they cancel one another out. Whereas Marx would say there's actually 200 in value. To commit to the idea that it is within exchange that value is created is to pay way too much, uh, is to allocate way too much weight to the propensity of capitalists to swindle other people. So sure, capitalists might be able to get something for even more than 100% surplus value or above the standard profit rate because they might just lie to someone and say that something's worth more than it actually is. And to Loria, that would mean then, therefore, that value has been created in exchange when that is not value. That's just the representation of value being exacerbated. So that actually works to reduce value. It reduces the amount of living labor embodied within products and therefore makes it that much more difficult for those products to actually be repurchased by that labor because the labor that was put into it was um, the value of it was deflated as the price of it was inflated to earn the capitalists more money. Now here Engels turns to the origins of capitalist production or uh, of commodity exchange where he says that um, where he presents a passage from Marx where Marx suggests that products are transformed into commodities at the point when trade extends beyond an immediate community to other communities. So if it's just within an immediate community, the idea is that they're only going to satisfy needs. Products are going to be made to satisfy the needs of people and the communities. And so in earliest societies, people just su supplied for themselves. Trade with other communities implies some excess product, more than what your community uh, needs for itself is being traded somewhere else. And that implies that the community is going to be getting something else for that excess product. And here we open up the possibility for a market and exchange of commodities. So in these early periods, there wasn't necessarily exploitation to produce these goods. There may have been, but not necessarily. Nor was there an effort to replace knowledge of agrarian life with mass production. So production, some kind of, well, let's just call it production, laboring wooden shoe, without uh, replacing knowledges just by locating it exclusively among a few capitalists who could exploit that knowledge in order to extract profit and capital for themselves. So people at the time who were mostly farmers would trade little, and what they did trade wouldn't be transformed into a means of earning more opportunities to trade, that is, capital. And at these points, the cost of trade would have been determined by the amount of labor simply applied to a product. And the other person would trade for it to save themselves time. Or at least that's one of the possible reasons. And this is, like even Adam Smith recognizes this, and you know, to, to his credit, he made many really good observations about the nature of the economy and the nature of trade. But one of his, um, one of his points, and this is something that Engels is picking up on, is that trade occurs in such a way as to uh, the, where the thing that you're getting out of the trade is meant to stand in for some degree of time, where you think that it is easier for you to buy this thing than to put in your own time to make it. But this here, we're only talking about like the earliest forms of trade, not full on uh, capitalist production. And of course, at these times, there would be discrepancies. And this is exactly what Marx already wrote. And Engels is just re it's recapitulating it. So maybe it would take someone a ridiculously long time to make an axe versus somebody else or to make anything. Or maybe people couldn't, wouldn't know how to count. Or um, they would trade things that required no labor, like they would trade animals, for example. And so they would only guess at what an equivalent would be. But as time went on and more trade occurred... Of course, people got a better sense of what things are worth. And in the case of animals, it's interesting as well, because in a lot of cases, cattle were used as a kind of currency, as a kind of as a universal equivalent with which to trade for other things, uh, which is just interesting when you consider the history of money, where money was almost forced upon people to adopt as a means of uh communicating exchange 
and you know there were certain states that had vested interest in this and forcing people to do that but in this case in these earlier forms likely without any state control people recognized that there was some kind of value to uh cattle and it was used everyone had um some kind of a use for it and therefore it could serve as a universal equivalent but that didn't last of and anyways it's just interesting i, I like this stuff so there's also difficulty in assessing the value of goods that came from elsewhere so you wouldn't necessarily know how much labor time was needed to produce i don't know saffron if you're from uh, denmark or you know anywhere else or how much time it would actually make to uh, procure rice if you're in North America, anything like that. And so it would be difficult to actually assess the value of things. When metal money entered the picture, however, it would ultimately work to facilitate this exchange or these exchanges because it could be easily transported, everyone recognized it as being valuable, and so on. Now, Engels suggests that it was around the time that the roots of capitalism started to form in the 15th and 16th centuries with merchant capital and user, well, user's capital, that we saw an end to the strict law of value as being tied to labor that Marx identifies. And at this point in the 15th and 16th centuries, merchants enter the picture and they are instrumental in establishing profit and the average rate of profit. Still, in this early form, however, that wasn't really capitalism, but really it's, it's, it's kernels, it's roots. And prices were hardly consistent, and they often tended toward monopoly rates because there wasn't a lot of communication to be able to actually be able to establish socially necessary labor time or average prices. And then over time, with competition, with trade between various markets, then average prices could be established and average profit rates. So the profit process of large-scale industry looks like this. Essentially, this is the process. Merchants want more profit. And the only way to do so is to become the owner of the means of production, including labor. So merchants are like, well, I could just make this money myself. Uh, and this will allow them to depreciate wages or to make people work harder or make them work longer and earn more surplus value to undersell their competitors. And it puts all self-sufficient farmers out of work because they can't, can't compete. And it, you know, if you have, um, a really rich capitalist show up at your door and this is the plot of all western films which is super you know it's super interesting if anyone wants a brief uh presentation about western films if you watch old western films it's almost always about a greepy gr greepy greedy corporate capitalist trying to take up land of just everyday common folk and it's funny because the Western very much today stands in or serves as kind of boomer catnip as a sign of like rugged, um, hard masculinity. And these people tend to vote conservative and to believe that the government is screwing them over. When in the Western, it's almost always corporations. And it's interesting because conservative politics in, this, in North America are the politics in favor of corporations now this isn't saying that left-leaning political system um, political parties aren't corporatist of course they are but they're just the conservative parties are just a lot more transparent about it anyways in these western films you often see this and then you have a lone ranger or whatever stand up against the corporation and this is a decent i guess kind of a decent image of what had occurred because if you have and of course, what, what we're describing happened many <laughs> centuries beforehand. But if you have a really rich capitalist show up at your door and say, I'm going to give you way more than you, you could ever imagine for this piece of land, who's going to say no? And so over time, all of these lands were just taken up uh, by capitalists. And then there was no land, or very little land actually owned by anybody on their own. And then Engels concludes here by looking at the stock exchange to say that it has gained a lot more prominence since Marx wrote Capital Volume 3 in 1865. At the time when Marx was writing, it had a lot of prominence, it had a lot of power, but all that Engels is saying is that this intensified greatly 
Uh, and we, we certainly see that today. I mean, the stock market has its tendrils everywhere. It, it has its claws into every single uh, part of the market. Of course, there are, there are some industries that aren't on the stock exchange. There are few, only a few of them, and they're pretty small. So most big corporations are exchanged publicly, uh, which is just a, a clever trick to think that regular everyday people could have some kind of participation in the movement of the market. But anyways, well, I guess it would be disingenuous to say that they can't because we can think of the GameSpot thing a few years ago when GameSpot people who own stocks or bought all the stocks in GameSpot or something to artificially elevate its price and it, it just skyrocketed um, to which all of the like big bankers were pissed because they're like, that's not real as though what they do is real. Anyway, so Engels stress is just how much the stock market had exchanged and had made um, accumulation essentially outpace production. And that's really something that uh, I take from these volumes is the way that uh, production takes uh, takes a back seat to the accumulation of capital, which is totally contradictory. It doesn't make any sense. But production actually becomes a barrier to the accumulation of capital, even though production is exactly the bedrock of capitalism, just like how land ends up being a hindrance to the accumulation of capital, and labor does as well. And so capitalism is always trying to circumvent these barriers. It sees, in this case, it's seeing... Uh, production as a barrier because who would want to pay out all these employees and other uh, you know the things they need or pay out people for getting injured or their health care when you can just invest in someone else's business and earn stupid amounts of money that way so it tries to always circumvent that to just earn more money uh, out of nothing and everything has come under command of the stock market, stock exchange. And Engels is writing this in the late, later in the 19th century when he's talking about how colonialism is motivated by the stock market, how government Im infrastructure is motivated by the stock market, where wars are being orchestrated, disorganized by the stock market, which is obviously all very concerning. And yeah, that pretty much ends this off here. Uh, it's been quite a ride. If, if anyone's made it this far, uh, pat yourselves on the back. You're, I like to think you're my friend. Uh, we, uh, I'm proud of you. But I hope that what I was able to offer here was insightful, that you were able to get something from it. Uh, if there's anything I got wrong or excluded, I'd love to hear for, hear about you, um, hear from you about it. Uh, if there's anything I could have done better, you know, I'd love to hear about it. If you like what I did, like, share, subscribe. You can tell your friends. They might get a kick out of it if they want. A uh, somewhat quick way to get into Marx. I might be able to provide that. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot for tuning in. I'll probably, I think that the next week I'll do, I'm, I'm thinking about doing a bigger chunk of post-colonial stuff now. Might do Edward Said and then move into some other perspectives. Like um, um, I wanted to, to do Annie Alumba. I might do that. Anyway, anyways, for those of you that have listened this far, Thanks a lot and take care.